Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to In the Spotlight. Today's episode is uh, uh, some very important information on uh, COVID-19 and vaccinations. We are very happy to have with us Dr. Peter Michalos, who's a consultant for many wonderful podcasts and, and TV programs. And we are happy to have him also with us here uh, on New Greek Television. Dr. Michalos is, um, uh, besides a doctor, also a medical researcher, and he worked through the pandemic uh, in Long Island, specifically in the Hamptons. Uh, he was working the first line, and we thank him for his service and all his bravery, and he's just been a plethora of information for us during these uh, uh, reporting uh, of COVID-19. Dr. Michalos, welcome back to uh, New Greek Television and in the spotlight. Thank you very much. It's great to be with you. Dr. Michalos, uh, we are now uh, over, you know, we're about a year into um, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, We have been through a lot. Uh, We are hoping they're saying that there might be herd immunity. And of course, it's been a big rollout of the COVID-19 vaccines worldwide. Um, There are many different types of vaccines out there uh, that have been approved and that are that are being uh, uh, admitted as we speak. Um, I'd like for you to give us some insight and, and enlighten us a little bit about the importance of vaccines, the difference between the wax- vaccines and um, what it is that you advise the audience uh, to do and which populations are most vulnerable and should definitely consider them. Well, we need vaccines in order to fight diseases and vaccines have been around for quite a while back from the days of smallpox. And uh, to give some historical perspective, for example, measles, which was a very devastating disease. We started vaccinating in the United States in 1963, but we didn't eliminate measles till the year 2000. So it took quite a while. Vaccine development usually takes a very long time. It's unprecedented that we were able to have vaccines against coronavirus within a year. Just to put it in perspective, AIDS has been around for 40 years and and, uh, certain people uh, in Washington who've been in charge of that program for 40 years uh, and we still don't have a vaccine. So think about how we came together in Operation Warp Speed to create these vaccines. There are different types of vaccines. Some of them are a live virus that has been attenuated. What does attenuated mean? It means that it's been stunned so that it can actually inflict the disease, but our body's immune system recognizes it like facial recognition and says, oh my God, there's coronavirus, I must attack. And basically vaccines are like a dress rehearsal for our immune system. What is our immune system? Think about the game Pac-Man, the virus which wants to enter our bodies because the virus doesn't have a body. It needs a hotel, it needs a host. So it seeks out humans. That's why it becomes very contagious. So when it enters our bodies, we need to fight it before it enters our cells and replicates. And what antibodies do is they're like little Pac-Man. They block the virus and sit over it. The virus has the little skeleton key spike proteins that we see in the photographs where you call it a corona, which is a crown with its little spikes. And those are what enter into our body and into our cells. And those are like skeleton keys and they seek out a keyhole. There are various cells in our body that are the keyhole to enter into our cells. It just happens that our lungs are one of them, our intestinal tract are another one. And one of the largest ones is actually fat cells. And that's probably the reason why people who are obese tend to have more problems with the coronavirus. And when you study around the world, the number of people who die per million In the countries where the people are very thin, the death rates are very low. For example, Vietnam, Japan, Singapore, and some other places like even India. Look at the death rate per million. It's much lower. And now we know that the virus enters through these ACE2 receptor keyholes, I call them, and Mm -hmm. uh, they are more common in obese uh, people. So Vaccines basically are a dress rehearsal. They tell the immune system, hey, look, uh, this looks like coronavirus. So the next time it sees those spike proteins that will enter our cells, it prepares this attack, launches it, and blocks it from entering our cells. There are different kinds of vaccines. The mRNA vaccines have never been used before, have never been successful before because they've never had one. So it's unbelievable that they even made them. And it's a type of vaccine 
that travels into the body and actually enters the cell and it actually starts to manufacture the little skeleton keys of the virus so that it fools our body as they float into our immune system and our blood and they look like the virus, but they don't have the body. Our body launches an attack against those manufactured proteins. So the next time it sees the real thing with the real body of the vaccine and the whole corona, just like you see it in pictures, it, it, it blocks it and it attacks it from entering the cells. Dr. And Michael, then, let's just before you move on for a second, can we just explain to the audience what mRNA is and why it, it is how it, it's new into uh, into vaccines? Well, it, well, RNA is a new. It's been around for millions no, of years. No, mRNA. It's just that the the messenger RNA vaccine mechanism is something new. Right. And the technology is new that you're able to basically attach these proteins that will enter a human cell and actually take over the machinery. It's like going into a factory, hijacking the factory, and say, you have to make umbrellas today. And then the factory is like, what do you mean I have to make umbrellas? You're going to make umbrellas today. So it takes it over, and you start making these umbrellas that look like little spiked proteins, and they look like coronavirus. So it's going into our own cell factory and telling it, you're going to start making a little keys that look just like coronavirus so it directs it directs the body directs, to okay yes, very good which is which is really unprecedented and uh the John, johnson and johnson the single shot works by a different mechanism where it, it tells it to make proteins but through a different mechanism that's already been tried and tested it's been used in ebola and that method of manufacturing has been around for a long time and then so that's the more traditional, uh, that's the more, more traditional, more traditional vaccine, vaccine is Johnson with, and Johnson. With a, with a single shot. Now, and, if I was in charge, I would tell the government to take anybody who's 65 and under to just give them one shot of the Pfizer or the Moderna, because they've shown that just after one shot, you get 90% protection in two to three weeks. So in order to vaccinate more people and try to get more herd immunity, Mm -hmm. If I were making the decisions, that's what I would do is anyone 65 and under, just give everybody one shot and just get some immunity going. Because when the virus has no place to jump and it doesn't have a hotel to find, then it can't mutate. The more it jumps, it mutates more. And pandemics last about 18 months. And we know that as the pandemic goes on, the virus learns to become more contagious because it wants to survive. But eventually, it actually starts burning out historically at around 18 months, which for us will be June. Why? Because if it keeps killing its host human hotel, it won't survive. So we, it wants to survive. So it learns not to keep killing its hotel, the human being, and also animals. Because I think even animals and our pets may end up needing vaccinations. And people are looking into that. And as you know, as the case reports, that animals at the Bronx Zoo actually tested positive for coronavirus. Can you tell us a little bit about the, uh, the testing? Uh, the, uh, tell us what it is that these tests have been designed to, to look for or, or to find what, what they're finding. Are they finding any virus or are they finding, are they been created for specifically the, the COVID-19? Well, they're looking for the COVID-19. There are certain, uh, when you look at a key, you see how it has certain notches and every virus has different notches, just like a key. The coronavirus has certain specific protein patterns mm -hmm. that, for example, the rapid flu test can pick up, the rapid stress strep test can pick up. Okay. So we have these rapid tests, sometimes rapid tests, depending on the examiner, when you're sticking a swab up somebody's nose, did you get enough of a sample? So there are several factors, what stage of infection people are in, how much virus they're shedding. Then there's one that's done in the hospital through a more sophisticated method that picks up even the most minute chemistry of the virus called the PCR test. And that's the one that they're requiring before you go for surgery or before you have to be operated on. The good news is now they've said that if you have been vaccinated, the CDC recommendation from the other day is that if you're exposed to someone with COVID and you've been vaccinated, you don't have to get tested and quarantined necessarily unless you have symptoms. So that's a major change. And also people who've been vaccinated can now gather indoors in groups. And in New York State, you can have functions of 100 people indoors 
and outdoors 200. So I think that, you know, those anti-vaxxers out there, you're going to find that you're not going to be able to travel. I think many countries aren't going to accept people who either will have to show evidence that they do have antibodies and they've recovered from the disease or they've been vaccinated. The other problem with all of this is we don't know how long those antibodies will last or how long the vaccine generated antibodies. The other issue is we don't know whether being vaccinated will block transmission. We know that all three vaccines, when you take them, 99%, you will not die. But we don't know if it blocks the transmission. So meaning you can still get infected. It can still be in your nose and your sinuses. You can be uh -huh. in a room and be vaccinated. But the anti-vaxxer who hasn't been vaccinated, that's the person that's susceptible to getting sick and potentially uh, dying. Let me ask you something, Dr. Michalos. What do we need to know about the safety of the COVID-19 uh, vaccinations? Well, so far, I mean, compared to most other vaccines, the safety profile has been very high. All uh, vaccines, including the flu vaccine, there's going to be, you know, some reactions. There are certain issues, like, for example, in pregnant women, you know, I haven't seen the exact, you know, nobody's come out with, you know, what should people in that situation do? We just don't know enough about it yet, but what we do know is we have a disease that's killed over 510,000 people in the United States, over mm -hmm. two and a half million worldwide. And if you have an option to take it or not to take it, it's not only about us as individuals. If you take a vaccine, you're doing it for your community, for Yaya, Papu, for your friend, your girlfriend, your wife, that you don't want to transmit it and you want society to be able to open up. Because it's not only about the virus, it's about the psychological damage, the number of suicides, the increase in drug addiction, the women who haven't gone to get their mammogram because, because of this, the men and women who haven't been getting their colonoscopies because of this, their ultrasounds, their pap smear tests. So there's a lot of deaths that will be indirectly linked to this crisis that nobody really is addressing and nobody is talking about. Dr. Nicholas, uh, on that note, um... Tell it. Can you just give me a little bit of information on if you have already had the COVID? I mean, if you've already had COVID nineteen, are you? Do you have antibodies, or do you have to take the vaccine? Well, that's going to be part of our annual physicals. I suspect that annually we're going to be going for our blood work when we get a physical, and it's not just a blood test that tells you whether you have or not have antibodies. You're going to have to ask for antibody titers. So if you come back with a blood test that shows that you have elevated antibody titers, then they will say, well, at this point, you have excellent antibody titers against COVID-19, so you might hold off for a booster or another vaccine. But we don't really know that. I know there's work right now at Columbia University where the infectious disease department is uh, doing measurements, and they're showing that after six months, those who've had it, their antibody titers are beginning to drop. So we don't know if this is going to be one of those uh, lifetime immunity things or how long immunity will last. Like tetanus, for example, you take a tetanus shot, it's 10 years. Measles can be a lifetime. Flu vaccines are every year and keep changing. But now with these variants, we're going to have to be adaptive and the vaccine may be changing every year. Albert Bora from Thessaloniki said that he can make a new variant vaccine in six weeks. So that's the beauty of mRNA that they'll be able to adapt quickly to make vaccines to adapt to specific variants. And what do these variants mean? Basically, the South African variant, they exposed it to blood and antibodies of people who recovered from COVID. And that variant was actually able to evade the antibodies. It was like, hey, I recognize you antibody and I'm not going to be captured by you. And it actually evaded it. So that's what's scary when we hear these new variants. The great news is that Merck which is an amazing company, um, has an antiviral called MK4882, which was discovered in ferrets, which have a similar immune system to humans. And there's going to be a pill, just like Tammy fluids for the flu, we're going to have a pill for coronavirus. Oh, and wow. That's going to be out hopefully by April. So that's going to be what I call the real game changer. So even if you've been vaccinated, if you get infected with a variant, you'll be able to take these pills for a week and actually block all RNA coronaviruses. And I think that's really gonna be the turning point in this pandemic. So just to recap, you're suggesting 
that we will be reaching some sort of herd immunity as, as every other pandemic has shown after 18 months of its inception. So, I mean, really, when did it hit, hit the world? They're saying it was as early as October uh, of, of 2019. So we've already hit that mark, supposedly, but let's just say for argument's sake, it well, was March. December, December is when December. Like our era. So you're saying that December was the first time it was announced that the coronavirus has started to spread. I think here, they, they're in Italy, for example, they started earlier because they were doing a cancer study and they saved those blood tubes of the people from the cancer study. And they went back into samples from October, 2019, mm -hmm. and they found COVID back in October in Italy. So yeah. it's been around for a while. And so in your opinion, after seeing and researching, you're seeing that it's kind of getting to herd immunity um, around the world because it's almost hitting that 18 month mark or it will be by well, June. Well, that's not herd immunity. I just think that the virus is maybe starting to burn out a little bit, but people are right. still getting sick. People are still dying from this. It's still, the, we have to be careful. Absolutely. And the people that are most at risk, you're saying what factors are involved and who should be more careful? Want to give obese, us a little bit of- Obese people, hypertension people, cardiac patients. And the other thing is they didn't test the- vaccines on, on uh, necessarily on obese cardiac or cancer patients. So we don't even know what kind of protection. If you look at the study, obviously, when you're testing a study, you want your vaccine to look like it's doing great. So those 90% numbers, I don't know how real they are if you started testing people with a lot of the underlying conditions. So that changes, that changes everything and you have to be aware. But what I want to do tell people the takeaway point is if you get sick and you have fever, and you start losing your sense of smell, do not waste time. Do not sit at home and take Tylenol. See your doctor immediately because you can get antibodies. The amazing antibodies that were invented by the Greek Americans, uh, George Yankopoulos and uh, Christos Kiratsus, who trained at Columbia and our Regeneron. You go, you get an hour infusion right away, just like Chris Christie does, just like the president got, just like Ben Carson got. And those people did fine. So don't waste time because once it gets into your lungs and your lung starts attacking it, it's like drowning, your lungs fill with fluid. And that's where I've seen people got in trouble. I've had husband and wives where the husband accepted treatment. The wife said, no, she was 45 and healthy. She was dead in a week. So these things do happen. Take it seriously. If you are not feeling well, you test positive, you go to your doctor and say, I want antibody infusion. If you haven't been vaccinated, get treatment, don't delay. This is not a joke and you can go south very quickly. And also some of the most vulnerable populations are the elderly and what ages, from what ages on should they uh, be more careful? Well, the majority of the people who died were over 75. So those people have to obviously be careful, but even if you're younger, if you're obese mm -hmm. and have diabetes and hypertension, that is a problem. So. Right. So, and more reason for us to lose weight because many people put on a lot of pounds during the pandemic because what was there to do? A lot of people were locked indoors eating and I keep seeing people complaining that they've gained weight and obesity Sedentary. Turns, out, yeah. turns out to be a big problem. And again, just study around the world. The countries where people were thinner, they're much better than the United States and the Western countries and first world countries where obesity is a pandemic itself. Yes. Peter, as well as the safety of the, uh, there are the, the two types of uh, vaccines out there. And just to recap on, there, have, there hasn't been any incidences found to have, or, or are, some, are there some side effects that people should be aware of after being vaccinated? And what are the differences between the, um, you know, side yeah, effects? They all from have the different vaccines. People have fever. There's been cases of, you know, even with the mRNA vaccine, there's been some reported deaths, but they have to be investigated to see whether they would do the vaccine. Other comorbidities. Yeah, people sometimes feel, don't feel well after the second shot. People have gotten fever, chills. People feel tired. Let me just stick on one more point here. And for those people that uh, are, are questioning whether they should be vaccinated or not because they've already had COVID, what is your opinion on that? It, 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 do they have the antibodies or do you think they should be vaccinated? I think they should get a blood test and see what their levels are. I think if they have super high levels of antibodies, they may 
hold off for a while as their doctor recommends them to or not. But I think that probably the single shot vaccine will probably be uh, recommended more to the people who have some antibodies so that you don't get an exaggerated immune response and maybe okay. less side effects. But the Johnson Johnson is going to be available in big amounts because Merck is now helping Johnson and Johnson make more and Sanofi is also helping Johnson and Johnson and Pfizer make more vaccines. So that's why President Biden was able to say that by May, theoretically, we could have the entire adult population in this country vaccinated because everybody's now jumping on board and helping with the manufacturing. Very good. And uh, one last point, uh, Peter, it's important to talk about masks because there's a lot of misinformation out there. Uh, should people be double masking, single masking, and does masking protect you and to what extent? Yeah, wearing a mask. I, I don't do double masking because when you wear a double mask, it, res it, it they have a lot of resistance to air coming in and out and you start sucking in air from the side and pushing air out from the side. So I, I find that I also did an experiment with a pulse oximeter on my finger. When I put two masks on, my oxygen drops to 93. When I put one mask on, my oxygen is 95. And when I take the, the masks off, my oxygen is 99. So it does affect... Uh, you know, what's yes. happening. And then the other thing is don't wear those masks with the valves on. The valve, exhalation valves are for painters and auto body shops. I see people wearing these masks with the valves on it. If you have the disease and you're wearing a one-way valve, every time you breathe out, you're spewing the virus on everybody else. Oh, the other my. issue is that you're wearing it so you don't spread the virus. Because when you cough, the Kobe University study showed and the MIT Fluid Dynamics Lab showed that it can go up to 26 feet. When the moist air is at 60% humidity, the virus does not travel fast. That's why hot countries, Caribbean, Africa, doesn't spread as much because in humid weather, the virus is small. It's only 125 microns, it falls to the ground. In dry, humid indoor restaurant air, it's blowing right across the room. And that's why if you can put humidity in your room, keep a hygrometer, higher humidity when you're in indoor gatherings, the less viral transmission yeah, um, another question for you. UV, Tell you me can also put UVC. Oh, okay, yes. Ultraviolet yes. I, I was C can say, also I'll be installed in your central air. I was going to talk about ultraviolet. Um, yes, if you can install that, there, uh, there are some systems out there, and it's been proven that it does kill the virus, correct? Yes, it kills viruses, mold, and bacteria. They already use it in Florida a lot for mold mitigation, but the side effect is it also kills viruses, and that's probably why the nursing homes in Florida do much better. And in modern buildings where you have one central air doing 10 rooms, that's why everyone gets ship on, uh, sick on cruise ships, because one ventilator might control 20 rooms and it's shared air. So the old pre-war buildings are actually better because you don't share air with other apartments. You're not dealing with a central air handler. And that's why in the office here where I work, we put in the UVC sanitizer. So all the air that's moved around is constantly being zapped. Ultraviolet C got the Nobel Prize in 1903 for killing skin infections, and they showed it kills mold, viruses, and bacteria. And in Marseille, France, where actually there were a lot of Greeks there, and they used ultraviolet C in the pipes, used clear glass pipes, and they zapped the water to kill bacteria in the water supply to have fresh water. And it can also be used in swimming pools where you use less chlorine and less chemicals in your pool if the water travels through a UVC sanitizing pipe. That's brilliant information. Uh, we thank you so much. You're such a plethora of information, uh, Dr. Michalos. Uh, yes, and I have just one more question for you. People were asking about if masks cause hypoxia. Yeah, if you have an underlying lung condition, you know, and you're wearing double masks, it's a problem. But I think some mask is better than no mask. And you don't necessarily have to have the thickest mask in the world, but just having something on helps to block some of the virus from either leaving your system or entering your system. And the reason where people wear glasses and goggles is because theoretically this can attach to your tear film traveling through your eye, down into your nose, through your tear duct. So even in heavily masked places, there was still transmission because I believe that it also can get in through our eyes. This is a nasty little virus.
<laughs> it is a nasty little virus. We are getting over it. We are working together. We're all being responsible citizens. Dr. Michalos, thank you for your time, your service, and all your information to our viewers. We hope to have you back on again. Uh, we hope this will be over soon. And um, thank you again for all that you do for the community. Thank you. This too shall pass. And thanks for always getting the truth out. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Bye.